Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greta Ettinger, and we don't know where Brian Broom is. Hopefully he hasn't fallen off the face of the earth. We'll get back to you on that. Um, today we're talking about stories and fiction and why Christians should read fiction, if they should. Let's not presume our conclusions here. Why not? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's start off with stories. Why don't you tell us, Greg, a story that had an influence on your life? Oh, you mean tell about a story, not yes. actually tell this. Thank you. I did not really want to tell a story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, we were talking before the podcast, and my first reaction to that question was, my mind immediately goes back to all of the children's stories that I heard when I was a kid, particularly those that Captain Kangaroo read to me. He, he was a TV personality, in case you don't know. Uh, when I was five and six, things like The Little House, uh, Make Way for Ducklings, the story about Ping, Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel, uh, and there are a few others. They stuck with me, and, and when we knew that we were going to have a first baby, uh, we were wandering through a local, like, we would have called them a department store, I don't know what this generation calls them. I saw a bunch of books thrown out on a, a table, and I looked through them, and there was Make Way for Duckling. So we didn't know the gender of the child. I don't think we'd even settled. Well, we hadn't settled the name, obviously. And I said, I got to buy that, because my baby needs to hear that story read. <laughs> uh, it, the story is sweet and simple. Uh, the, the hand artwork is also sweet and simple and, and very well done semi-realistic with a little bit of a comic flair. It's it's the story of Mama and Papa Mallard who settle down in a park, I think it's in New York, and she lays her eggs and the ducklings hatch, and while Daddy goes off to do whatever Daddy Ducks do, she has to take her ducklings for a walk, and um, the traffic cop has to stop traffic for them, and everybody <laughs> is... There's ducks coming. What ducks? A bunch of mallards. That story, other stories like that. It was C.S. Lewis who said that if a story, if a children's story is not good enough for an adult, it's not good enough for a child. Mm -hmm. There is that in us that relates to stories. Stories can be simple. They can be complicated. And, and both have their appeal. Sometimes it's the sheer simplicity of a story will strike home with us. You can think of the story of Ruth in Scripture. Esther, which is a little more subtle <laughs> and complicated. Yeah. Or on the other hand, you can think of Lord of the Rings or War and Peace, or their Crime and Punishment. Um, there, there's, a, there's all kinds of stories with degrees of, of both of simplicity and complexity. And uh, that shouldn't surprise us. God is one and he's many. He is simple and yet his attributes are infinite. So we should be able to find things in stories of various sorts that, that appeal to us. Of course, the question is, why stories at all? Mm -hmm. And why make-believe at all? Why not? And you've mentioned that you've heard this. I, I've heard it too. Why, why read something that never happened? Why spend your time reading about non-reality when you can read about things that actually have happened? I think there's a number of answers to that. Mm -hmm. Well, we can we can work our way through, and then of course the other side is why is story so powerful? Why do we like to hear stories, even if they're real, even if they're stories that really happened, more or less? Uh, why are we so drawn to them? So those those are a couple of things we can talk about. You, yeah. but you haven't told me yet what kind of stories <laughs> made an impact on you when you were young. Or well, the first point. thing that comes to my mind is actually The Great Escape, which hmm. is a World War II movie. If you're not familiar. It's a bunch of British and American and one stray Australian <laughs> prisoners of war in a Nazi prisoner of war camp. And it's based on real events. It's condensed. Some of the characters are composites of real people, but it's based on what actually happened when 
a lot of prisoners of war escaped by tunneling out of the camp. And I think what I can point to as the thing about this story that I like is the teamwork, Mm. that you have this cast of characters that all have different strengths and weaknesses and friendships that work together. There's a clear enemy and a clear goal, and they work together towards that goal. And to see the friendships grow and the setbacks and everything is part of what makes the story so compelling to me. You start to recognize, oh, I know a lot of people who have different strengths and weaknesses. I have a lot of different friendships with different people. I fit somewhere in this Mm -hmm. lineup. There's a place for you to enter in as another character um, and relate to other people the way you've seen relationships modeled for you. Actually, that's a one of the things that draws me to folk music as well. David teases me because I don't like this one YouTuber who's a very excellent singer, but he sings all the parts himself. Mm. Um, and so his voice doesn't blend because you can't blend <laughs> with yourself. You just have lots of layers. Um, and so it sounds too perfect to me. I'm like, where where does someone else jump in? There's mm. There's no invitation. To, mm-hmm. the, to the audience. So that's what I really enjoy. It's a common theme in a lot of stories. I am a sucker for team stories, <laughs> uh, particularly if it's the minor characters all banding together. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, there's people that are of the film in the background. Something's happened to our main, our main heroes. They're not available and all the little guys have to get together and maybe save, save the day or save the big guys or something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, those have always appealed to me. And so when I collected comic books, it was always the team books, um, Avengers, Teen Titans, and things like that. And you come to something like Lord of the Rings. And again, most certainly there's a team here with all you've described. All not just You're not just following one man or one woman. You're following a community that interrelate on a lot of levels. And yeah, you you... you I like the words you picked, modeled. You see life model for you. And if they're Christian heroes, godly heroes, or at least men and women who are conforming themselves outwardly to God's mm-hmm. laws, uh, you can see something admirable, something where you can say, I, I want friends like that. I want to be a friend like that. I, I want to create a team like that. I want a community like that. Oh, Wow, look, they're falling apart. No, they can't. But they're going to destroy my favorite TV show. Oh, wait, wait. I see. I bet this is what's going to happen. No, oh, it didn't happen. <laughs> oh, wait, they're going to... There it is. Okay, I see. I see what... Yes, yes, I feel so good about it. And the day tomorrow, everybody is having fun drinking and <laughs> celebrating and playing music and, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I would, I think I would like at this point to address the idea that isn't it better to, to study the things that, that really happened? There's a problem with that concept, I think. You you pick up an autobiography, a biography, especially a biography, or a history book, and you say, these things really happened. Odds are not. <laughs> biographies almost cer- or autobiographies almost certainly not, because the person's telling you some things and deliberately holding back others, because he probably doesn't want to make himself seem like the sinner and idiot he really is. So you are getting a distorted view. And even if he's truing his best to tell the truth, or his biographer is, he's picking and choosing details because it has to fit into a book or a movie. I appreciated what you said earlier. Based on a true story. Yeah, we (laughs) we know what that means. Uh, Not much. Uh, So when, when when you're reading, and even a history book, as carefully researched as they may be, it's they, impossible for it to be exhaustive. Yes. And yes. even if it had every fact that happened, like it, it would be so much noise that you couldn't figure out what yeah. was important of the things right. that happened. And yeah. then you will still only have one person's perspective right. on every item of history that happened. As someone who writes on history fairly often, I remember once upon a time I was I was reading, I don't even remember what exactly I was researching, but it was it was I think in order of battle, it might have been Alfred or, or some, something. And I went to some reliable history sources, and they said basically, first A, then B. And I went to another book and it said, no, it was B, then A. Hmm. I mean, flat out backwards. Like, what? 
Okay, I, I need to actually mention this because it's, it, it's just, I'm just going to mention it. But in order to get from where I am to where I'm going, I have to at least acknowledge that, that the, there were these battles here. So is it, who's right? Well, I had to do a lot more research. And I had to go through a lot of books. And finally, I found out, oh, it was A, then B, then A. <laughs> he did the A thing twice, but it wasn't showing up. And just reading the other two or multiple accounts of history, I was not getting the whole story. The facts presented just as they were left out something kind of major to trying to follow the sequence. Yes, they were true as far as they went, but by assuming that they were all truth, they they were distorting the narrative for me, and I was I was lost and confused. Especially if these people have both gotten on a witness stand and say we we swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, they didn't tell the whole truth. Yeah, but you can't, as you said. There's too much of it. There's there's too much to say. You you include things like, and so I kept breathing the whole time. You know, it's it's. <laughs> Um, and, and I had a snack. The snack consisted of, no, we really don't want to know. Well, but now you're leaving things out. And to what is your reader or your viewer, if it's movies or TV, what are they tracking with? What are they interested in? Maybe they actually are interested in what you ate. Mm -hmm. My first my first trip to um, to Europe, my little journal I kept was was very incomplete. But the one thing I tried to do every day was write down everything we ate because, you know, you go to a foreign country and eating is a big part of the experience. It's part of the story. You come home and you tell people, yeah, well, we went to this place and there was this little thing or the little place around the corner from the hotel and they had the best food and and you, it, that becomes part of the story. But other people might say, who cares about food? <laughs> Relationships, people, no, monuments, historical uh, records, museums, no, weather. What was the weather like? You know, everybody's going to focus on something. So there's always a purpose to it. Yeah. You're tending your narrative. There's always a goal in mind when you choose what to include or not include, right? You know, there's, there's a focus and an emphasis that's in the mind of the storyteller, which keeps it from, because, because we're not God, because we're not omniscient, and because we can't recreate reality, uh, so people can watch it. Mm -hmm. We always have to be selective. And in the process, if, even if we were sinless, we would still not tell the whole story. I forget where it is and in what context, but someone was suggesting, well, what if you had a map that was so accurate that it included every single geographical detail down to the finest thing in real measurements? That would be called Earth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which recreating Earth would be pointless because we've already got Earth. We want something that models it, that is mm -hmm. simpler, and that lets us focus on things. So we tell stories to bring focus to a particular sequence of events in such a way that it brings out something about life, about God's world, that we think will be entertaining, enlightening, edifying. Uh, uplifting, pick a word here, and there are probably a bunch of others. We can talk about all the all the reasons we want stories, but we're after something. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, we don't say everything and we can't say everything. And then we're back to, oh, and by the way, we are fallen and we are sinners and we do distort for various reasons. Uh, we we exaggerate, we amplify with with the full understanding. In most cases, one of my former students was in was back in the classroom today. Just he's been in the Air Force, and he was telling us all kinds of great stories. <laughs> but his his gestures and his and his mannerisms and his tone of voice, like I, I, I actually was thinking, no, that's not the way you said it at the time. But the way you're saying it now is sure entertaining. <laughs> you know, we, we all have friends who are great storytellers, but you can say, no, that's. That isn't really, I'm sure, exactly the way it happened, but it makes a great story when you tell it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, historians are more sober and they get they check their facts and they're more accurate. Yeah, if only that were true. <laughs> uh, but as someone who's written, ghost written two histories, one on Alfred and one on, on William Wallace, you're, you are so limited. There's so much you don't know and you mm -hmm. end up having to guess at certain things. And sometimes your guesses are following those who've gone before you. Uh, this this writer, this bard, this historian, this biographer presented Alfred, our, our um, 
what's his name, William Wallace, in such and such a way. How accurate is this? Probably, I mean, I can, I can honestly say, I don't think it's that accurate, but it's all I got. Mm -hmm. So I can caution a little bit. The, so his biographer says, you know, implied mm -hmm. caution that this is obviously uh, a Secondary biased account. Secondary opinion. <laughs> Secondary account. But what is there that's a primary account? Mm -hmm. I mean, really? Yeah. Um, we... But I saw it on TV. I saw the I saw the film from the news cameras. Oh, good, <laughs> right. You saw a, 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 a what a ten by fifteen area, uh, not even really much of an area with a limited amount of depth of action. You don't know what was on the right, what was to the left, what was behind the cameraman, what they all are looking at when they are looking toward the camera. You, you did not see reality. Mm -hmm. And so, again, a lot of these things where we think this is exact, this is real, this is the way it is, it, it ain't so. Mm -hmm. um, when when I was a kid, my, my dad was very politically um, opinionated. And I walked into his barber shop, probably in a haircut, I don't remember. And he mentioned that the TV show Johnny Quest had been on. And he knew I watched that. And it was the, the one where... Dr. Quest, Johnny, and Race and Hatier, their plane has to is forced to land for lack of fuel in someplace in the Andes. And there are condors. It's a book about it was a TV show about or a cartoon about condors as sort of the the mysterious thing in the background. But there is there also up here, up there in the Andes, uh, a retired German flying ace from the First World War mm. who becomes the villain. And my father asked me, did you get the propaganda in that? Well, dad used the word propaganda a lot, but he never, ever explained it to me. Mm -hmm. So I just had to deduce from the way he used it what it probably meant. And I thought it meant fiction. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, yeah, everything's propaganda, fiction, except the news. And dad looked at me and said, no, <laughs> you don't understand. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I had no idea what he meant at the time, but I remembered that. And uh, yeah, you, you, let's, let's listen to the news. We'll get the truth. We'll get the straight scoop. We'll get the real facts. Oh, that's probably the last place you're going to get the real mm -hmm. facts. Yeah. And, and so this thing of you should only listen to real things. Well, we'll qualify. You should read things that are based on reality or close to reality. Okay, well, that opens up most of the world of fiction for you right there. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point people will say, all right, so realistic novels and, and stories and movies are okay, but not anything that is utterly fantastic. I mean, you couldn't, for instance, have talking trees in any kind of story that would do any good for Christians. The well, Bible disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible disagrees since it contains a story that has talking trees mm -hmm. and God... God did not write the story directly, but he blessed it and included it in inspired scripture. And not only are there trees, they make reference to God and they engage in politics and do all kinds of trees that I'm, things that I'm pretty sure trees don't do. <laughs> and, and, and so now we're falling back on scripture as justification. The Bible is a book of stories. God is the one person who can tell a story with exact detail. Tell it from a perspective that is absolutely true and relevant without having to exhaust the material because he inf he knows infinitely well all the details and he can pick with complete accuracy what he's going to tell us and tell it in such a way that we're not misled or deceived. Mm -hmm. And he's the only one who can do that. So it, it, it is good to try to imitate our Heavenly Father and tell the truth and tell things that really happened. And yet we fear we find that was the stories in the book of Judges, the talking trees, uh, where God uses such a story, where God is, is willing to say, here, here's something that never could happen, never did happen, never would happen. And yet there, there are things to learn from it. Mm -hmm. And the lesson in that particular one is the trees go out to choose a king is, yeah, the really productive trees don't want to be king because <laughs> yeah. they got jobs to do. They have high callings before God. Mm -hmm. They make oil, they make wine, and so on. Mm -hmm. But the bramble bush, who's a complete wastrel and has nothing going on for him. Very he'll... excited to be king. He's very excited to be <laughs> oh, king. He and, just and, can't wait, wait to, be, to king. be king. Yeah. So, you know. And God thinks that that 
fictional fantasy story ought to have a place in scripture. And so I put it there. And, and, and so at this point, I think we, we've kind of, we've kind of begun to answer things. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have, do our Christians obligated just to read real stories? Well, aside from the Bible, <laughs> the question of real is, is it's the word real is itself a question begging sort of thing. What, mm -hmm. what meanest thou by real? Yeah. So the question is, well, well, wait, this, this, this story of talking trees, they, they, they talk about God. Oh yeah. In that story, in that universe, if you will, God is. God does not write a fictional universe that he's absent from. Mm -hmm. He does not fill it with another God or no God. The trees acknowledge that God is and that he has a calling upon them. And so, and the bramble, the, well, the, the bramble is sinful and, and, and devious and, and greedy of power. And the other trees are godly. They want to serve God and do the thing, thing he's called them to. So there is virtue, there is right and wrong, and it's God's standard and that God is the God of the Bible. And I think in, in, in looking at fantasy, we, we can see that a lot of things you can mess with. Here we have trees who don't talk or think or engage in politics or worship God in our world. Here's a fantasy world where they do, but it's the God of the Bible they worship. And it, it is difficult for a Christian to generate or enjoy living in a fictional world where God isn't God, mm -hmm. where God's standards are not the standards. It's hard for a Christian to go into a world where, say, molesting children is okay, or raping women is just fine, or abortion is an acceptable uh, way of dealing with the population. Uh, I don't care if you set it on Mars or Alpha Centauri or in this, some kingdom beneath the, the surface of the planet or in Never Neverland. It's, it's, as Christians, we balk there and say, no, I don't want to go out of a world where God is. Now, it may be, even in, in other words, even in my fantasies, God is there. Mm -hmm. Because what's the alternative? And think of the Sermon on the Mount here. Am I allowed in my fantasies to reject God and his law and serve my own lust? If it's, and so if I can simply say, but it's only pretend, are we allowed to get away with that? Jesus says, no. What's in your heart and your thought life matters. Mm -hmm. So as Christians, we can say, there's a place for fantasy stories, for imaginative stories, for stories of things that haven't happened, couldn't happen. But even when you go there, in most cases, unless you're trying to make some kind of odd point, you want God to be there. I mean, you want God to be there. Why would you not want God with you? God's your Lord, your Savior, your best friend. Why would you not bring God with you? <laughs> the only kind of exception to this I can think of in Scripture is where Paul, on a couple of occasions, for just the barest moment, postulates a world where Christ didn't die. If they had known this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Mm -hmm. For the moment, he indulges in the what if. A world where Christ didn't die because people actually realized who he was and decided not to kill him. And then he goes on. That's it. That's as far mm -hmm. as he can stay there. there. There's another passage I cannot remember right now where he does something very similar. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, if the, oh, well, let's eat and drink for tomorrow. We die if Christianity isn't true. And he stops there. In, in other words... If even in fiction, even in imagination, this storyline goes nowhere real fast. <laughs> and so as Christians, we don't want to do that, maybe for a quick apologetic effect, but not for staying and living there. These are not worlds that Paul invites us into to enjoy, where, the, where Christ didn't die and, and the gospel isn't real. They're, they're apologetics. Well, <laughs> do you really want to be there? Didn't think so. <laughs> and, and so that's more the issue than whether or not Elves or Eldils are real things or could be real things. The point is, does this is this book consistent with Christian theology and ethics? Does it reflect God as we know him to be? And, and then that's bringing us back to the, so why in the world would Christians go into stories or into fiction? Mm -hmm. Well, if they're going into good fiction, they're going into another way of seeing how God might do things under other circumstances where our vision is focused in on particular things 
and the imaginative quality, whether it's simply we're creating the, the Avonlea and Green Gables, or we're creating Middle Earth and Hobbiton, in both cases, we're shown aspects of what is ultimately human life, human character, human interaction, under circumstances that allow us to think about things and evaluate things and enjoy things and appreciate things that we might miss if it were set in the slums in New York or mm -hmm. a Los Angeles beach. It's so, things we can relate to. Things we can and relate to. I was thinking of the prophet Nathan when he confronted David. Oh, there you go. The way that he approached this very difficult problem of not only is this person I know involved in something very, very wrong, not only is he guilty, but he's the king. And I am in a lot of trouble if I upset <laughs> the king. And so the way he goes about this problem of getting the king to see the true nature of his actions mm -hmm. is to tell a story, to get his emotions involved, to engage his discernment in a way where he's not on the defensive. Right. He's actually using his discernment. And we don't know if the scenario that Nathan proposed there, this little man had his one little ewe lamb, he raises a daughter. We don't know whether that had ever happened or not. Nathan is not lying because he immediately reveals that the story he's telling is not about lambs and people. It's about David and women. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have happened. It's it's a likely enough kind of thing that could happen. People are cruel to animals. People, rich men steal from poor people and oppress them. And and, and thus the ethical quality, it, it is a real, I mean, when people say, well, shouldn't you, you, you be where things could happen? Well, they, ethically, this can happen. This this is this is the world of creation of sin and redemption. This little story that Nathan tells, whether or not the facts ever had been played out in history then or sometime later, is irrelevant. He's not lying. He's telling a story to make a point, one which David gets immediately. And so mm -hmm. David is deceived for a very short time. But the purpose is not to deceive David, but to undeceive him, mm -hmm. to break through the 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 bodyguard of lies he said about himself. Well, I'm the king. It doesn't matter. Uh, he would have died anyway. There was a baby on the way. I can do more for the baby than he ever could. Um, I, I really do love her. You know, all the things that people throw up to make excuses. Uh, Nathan's story cut through the lies to establish the truth. Mm -hmm. And fiction can do that sometimes. Sometimes on a deep moral issue like this. Sometimes just on a what is still ethical, but the, oh, the way we look at life. Mm -hmm. And the way um, we look at other people. And the way we look at other people. And situations and places and conditions. You you go to Middle Earth and you come back and you see our world. And you say, oh, that's kind of like this. But I've never seen Middle Earth. I can see this. This is beautiful. This waterfall is beautiful. This forest is enchanting. <laughs> God is an, an incredible creator. So those are some of the things. I'm sure we haven't exhausted it, mm -hmm. but keeping an eye on the clock, we probably should go back to the idea of story in your note mm -hmm. to me. You said, we, we've never defined story. I don't have an offhand definition of what story is exactly. Usually we speak of some kind of narrative that is a sequenced series of events will cause and effect. This leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to this that has rising action, that is, there is tension, conflict that leads to tension and, and thus to suspense. And it rises to a point where we, it engages us where we say, oh no, how are they going to get out of this? And at that peak moment, that climax, we get a resolution, which if the story's good, we didn't exactly see coming. If it's one that we saw coming, then it's a story we've already heard in one form or another. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we like to hear the same old story and told in a lot of different ways. And, you know, you can tell the same story. Shakespeare's been done. <laughs> uh, I, I've, seen, I've seen Macbeth done traditionally. I've seen it done as um, Mad Max post-apocalypse. And it worked <laughs> pretty well. I've seen Much Ado done traditionally. I've seen it done in a small southern community in the, I think, 1800s, no, the early 1900s, I guess, or late 1800s. 
I've seen it done uh, apparently post-Vietnam War. And so you can tell the same story. And if it's a good enough story, even you know, you know, you know where this goes. But the telling yes. can grab you and pull you along. Inferior storytellers just swap out a few names and a few minor details. It's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, she's going to go around the corner. She's going to see the monster. See, there it is. Yeah, and they didn't do a great job with the monster. Okay, well, the, the hero's going to show up. He's going to have the, the sword plus three of destroying. Yeah, see, he's got <laughs> Oh, they used a gun instead. Okay, well, that's cute. All right, sped things up. Yeah, the partner's going to, yeah, there he is. You know, we, we, yeah, yeah, a I've retelling needs some skill to carry it to make it worth <laughs> hearing again. Yeah, <laughs> but th those, and then usually we say the story ends with data with the data moth, where we all sit around and, depending on the nature of the story, explain what just happened, explain how we <laughs> figured things out, explain how the rescue took place. Uh, proposals are made, weddings are had, feasts are celebrated, and we all just have that ah, kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Arguably, the Data Mon Lord of the Rings begins with the rescue, or right after the rescue of Frodo and Sam on the fields of Kamalan. But it continues on with more storytelling as they return mm -hmm. to the Shire, where there's still action. But at that point, we know it's going to be okay. The big bad mm -hmm. guy's down. The little bad guys has become really little. Our heroes are now really heroes. And so we just want the assurance of, oh, yes, it's okay. Yeah, see, they handled it just fine. Nothing big happened. Um, and, and so th that that period, that uh, resolution period, that um, closure period <laughs> is important, but it can take very different forms. Mm -hmm. So that's something of what goes into a story, mm -hmm. what distinguishes it from a narrative. It's not just a sequence of it. So, hey, you want to hear a story? Yeah, okay. I Well, I, I, I got up this morning and I forgot that I, that I hadn't bought any... Um, any treats for my kids at school. So I, I, I got up and, and, and did my bath and, and got out the door early and I went to the store and I bought the candy and then I zipped to school. You know what? I gave them the candy. I'm so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> That's a narrative. I'm overwhelmed yeah. with... <laughs> Not surprised. Yeah. Um, that's a narrative, mm -hmm. a very bad one, but it's certainly not a story of any sort because stories imply this idea of conflict and meaning mm -hmm. and purpose as yes. well. Well, the conflict supplies the meaning and purpose. Now, here's mm -hmm. something that I, I always talk about in my literature classes. Where does this conflict come from? Well, before we can understand where it comes from, we, we, we need to just really briefly talk about. The various conflicts that show up all the time. You know, we mm -hmm. reduce it to something versus something. Man versus man, man versus woman, man versus society, man versus God, man versus the devil, man versus nature. And I'm sure I've left out a few, but you get the idea. It's somebody versus mm -hmm. something. But as you look at all of these at, for any length of time, you see in each case, the, the versus, the conflict is because of sin and the fall. Mm -hmm. Men are at odds with each other because they're sinners. Man is at odds with God. Because he sinned against God. Man is at odds with creation because creation is now God's agent for punishing man's sin. It too is under the curse. Um, and and you, you can go through the list. Uh, even man against himself, man against himself is dealing with the fact that his body is cursed. His, his ability to perform at top proficiency is cursed. Um, we... In an un think of what stories would be in an unfallen world. We really have trouble here, mm -hmm. where there's no sin, there's no conflict, there's no no one hates anybody, no one's out for himself. Everybody loves one another and encourages everybody and is enthusiastic for everyone else's success. And there's no danger whatsoever. Either you either you, jumping off the mountain won't kill you, or because the angels will catch you, or you're simply too wise. You're never going to do it anyhow because <laughs> God God doesn't have stupid children. So what do you got? What what kind of things could you have where there's there's some kind of conflict? And you're going to go, well, maybe climbing the mountain. Okay. But you know you can't die. You can't get hurt. <laughs> okay. That's not exciting. How about two people uh, running a foot race? Okay. One of them is probably better than the other because God does not make us all alike. So that's okay. But when they're done, they're going to say, oh, you did so great. No, you did great. Yeah, but you you encouraged me on. And yeah, you know, that moment when you stopped and helped me get up, that was that was so kind of you. <laughs> Even though I couldn't possibly be hurt because this is an unfallen world. But, you know, you, you, you thought about me. Yeah, yeah let's, let's go have a beer, you know, because there, there will be beer in the new creation. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the, well, the rest of us are sitting here saying, that's a story. <laughs> we don't, on this side of the fall, we don't understand how story would have worked without the fall. Mm -hmm. And so when we come to storytelling, there's going to be, if it's if the story has any depth beyond just being a clever anecdote or riddled, something with a twist at the end, something that's just a sheer surprise. If it's going to be a sustained story of any sort, there's going to be conflict, and that conflict is going to be rooted either in sin or the curse. So at this point, story is recognizing and registering Christian theology. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a created, orderly, reasonable world of cause and effect, where things don't just randomly happen in no particular order, where time flows forward, not backward, or in all random directions. A follows B follows C, and there my actions have consequences, and the consequences have consequences. And so I, I come into a story, and it can be God's world as it is, so a time and a place, and we look at the Bible, the time and the place, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We're in the, we're in the physical, real universe at a particular time, the beginning. <laughs> and we've already got our first character, our hero, God. And then we see wonderful, we learn about our character because God does all kinds of incredible, wonderful things. And we think, wow, what could ever go wrong here? And then we introduce the, the, the secondary characters. They're called man. <laughs> and we meet Adam and Eve. And then we see, oh, there's a test here. Huh, that's odd, but this is a holy, perfect God. And yet here are these people who are finite. Surely nothing could go wrong here. Wait, where did the serpent come from? And now we have the serpent. We have the dragon. And we have the, the woman. And we begin to start seeing the shape that many, many stories will take for centuries to come. Mm -hmm. uh, as the woman is deceived by the serpent, her husband fails her miserably. God does enact his curse upon them, and it looks like everything's going to end. There's going to be no story. And then God does some rarely created foreshadowing and says, um, here, I'm going to kill some animals. They're going to die and you're not. And I'm going to make this promise about the seed of the woman who will bruise the serpent's head. What, what does that mean, Lord? Think about it. It's about 4,000 years. And so the story begins to unfold. And the part of the, of the, the wonder and genius of God's story, of course, is that we don't know the solution. And for 4,000 years, people didn't know the solution. That, in part, is why it's called the gospel is called a mystery. It's something, Isaiah uses the phrase, I have not seen, nor you're heard, neither have entered into the, the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for him. Paul, in quoting that, says, "And but God has revealed them to us by his spirit. He's not talking about heaven or eternity, things we don't know. He's talking about the gospel, primarily. Mm -hmm. The gospel was something, that thing, that way of salvation that God has prepared from the foundation of the world was something so wonderful and so beyond our natural thinking that in the flesh and, and even the angels themselves could not see where this was going. Okay, holy, just, perfect God has to maintain his integrity, has to punish sinners. There's no doubt they're sinners. There's no doubt they rebelled against God. God said that the day they eat, they would die. He killed animals instead. What? Well, he's talking about grace and loving <laughs> sinners and all that. How does that work? And this was Satan's line for 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. You say you're a holy, just God, and why aren't all these people dead? Joe, that Job guy, he's not so hot. Moses, <laughs> Elijah. Um, and for 4,000 years, humanity is saying, what is God up to? And all along the way, God is dropping hints and clues. He's doing foreshadowing like a true mystery story. <laughs> he knows the solution. But until he, like a good Agatha Christie story. Once it's all out in the open, it's like, oh, of course. And we look back with 2020 hindsight and we see the slain lambs and the sacrificial blood, and the suffering servant of Jehovah, and the father offering his only begotten son on an altar. We say, of course, it's so obvious. How did the Jews miss it? Yeah, how did everybody miss it for Father's years? Because we don't think that way. Mm -hmm. And this incredibly clever story was telling us a story that we couldn't predict, we couldn't project, we could not see where this was going. How do you solve this? Because the solution that a holy, just God who is infinite and transcendent would assume human flesh, human nature, and die in the place of his enemies, in the place of the very people who killed him, so that they could be free and forgiven? 
Well, I wouldn't do that if I were God. Hmm. And neither would any other human sinner. And so it was so far out of anybody's calculation that even when Jesus said, I'm going to, we're going up to Jerusalem, I'm going to die on the third day, I'm going to rise again. They didn't understand. Mm -hmm. A true mystery story. Also a true romance. Mm -hmm. Because the the knight in shining armor, well, the, pet, the prince in disguise actually, <laughs> yeah. comes looking for his bride and lays down his life to save her. And of course, it's also an action story. Because Jesus is not tossed hither and yon by the forces of society or by political intrigue. He purposely, deliberately pursues the path toward the cross and then beats up death, smacks it in the face, stumps it down, <laughs> and rises again yeah. and ascends to heaven and begins smashing nations with his divine power and with the power of the gospel. So it's a mystery story. It's a romance. It's an action-adventure story. Uh, and it has all of the typical elements of we, we start in a time and a place with a given atmosphere, a given setting. We, we are introduced to conflict. How can God do this? And at each point, there seems to be more complications. Okay, it's got seed of the woman, whatever that means, the seed has to, the, we need the seed. Oh, look, the whole world got corrupt and God's going to have to wipe out everybody. That kind of ruins the story right there. Uh, Abraham, yeah, he's going to be the father of seed. What do you mean he married somebody else? <laughs> that, he can't be the seed. Abraham needs to get back on track. Oh, how about this family? they got 12 boys. One of the seed's going to come through one of them. What happens if they all gang up and throw one into prison and all the others get corrupted into horrible sins? Surely we, oh, we found Joseph. Oh, because Joseph's the goody, the goody two-shoots. He's the one who, the, the, he's not the one. <laughs> Judah, Judah, the one who went into his own daughter-in-law thinking she was a prostitute. He's the one? <laughs> we already talked about David. Adulterer, murderer, um, the murder of the babies at the time of Joash when Athaliah tries to kill the royal line, when Haman tries to exterminate the whole Jewish nation, when Herod, the last gasp attempt for Satan, kill all the babies. And then, no, wait, let's kill Jesus himself. Ha, got him. Uh oh. <laughs> we shouldn't have done that, should we? I think we just shot ourselves in the head. Yeah, the tomb is opening. We're in so much trouble. Um, you know, there's there's the story. God, God's drama of redemption is a drama. It is a story. And we, as his image, can learn from his storytelling how to tell big stories and little stories. Because the Bible itself in that one big story has all kinds of little stories that make it up. Things that really happened, but they're crafted as as story narratives that show us bits and pieces of the action, of the plot unfolding, and, and draw our attention to particular nuanced things, things about God that we might miss if all we had was the big story. And the Romans 8.28 tells us all things work together mm -hmm. for good. And I love that as part of this conversation about stories, because when we watch a movie where every shot tells us something, Mm. where every shot ties us into something else that happens, or a book when nothing is wasted, that yes. is the most satisfying. Yeah. We say that is an excellently crafted story. Yeah. Well, and so say, that had to be there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so to go back to what we were saying before about including all of the details we can't, God does. Yeah. He put all of those details in there, and he's not going to waste a single one of them. Yeah, you know, both in the history of the world and in scripture. In mm -hmm. the history of the world, every detail becomes significant because that's the story alive and living, moving, unfolding in history. But then the Bible, which is sort of the synopsis, every detail is important. Mm -hmm. As a Bible teacher, this is really important to me because I know Reformed pastors, elders, theologians, who would die for the truth that every word of scripture is inspired. But when you say, so, what, but why did God put it here? Well, because it happened. A lot of things happened. Why did he put this here? Well, mm. not, I, he just wanted to. But is there so, is he making a point? Well, no, I mean, that's just a number or that's just a color or that's just a, a random action. Why did he put it here? Just because it happened. You're trying to get too much out of it. The hidden things belong to the Lord, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children that we may learn to do all the words of this law. If it's in scripture, it has some significance. And that's something you said early on. Story produces meaning. 
because story is interpreted facts. Mm -hmm. There's an underlying uh, overarching interpretation that has selected these facts and has brought them together to produce a meaning. And we've talked before about our place, find, our, finding our place in God's story as, as the meaning of our lives and why knowing the sequence, the chronology of the story is important. Did I get married before or after the baby came? That's kind of a huge question. You know, it kind of affects all kinds of things. You mentioned a few minutes ago the word closure, hmm. uh, which I find very interesting. I'm sorry for using the word interesting. That's kind of a verbal non-entity. <laughs> I'm like, this is interesting. Yeah, That's struck, interesting. Well, what about have it? told us not to say that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I take back what I said. It wasn't interesting. Um, <laughs> it was important, though, I think. Um, there you go. I'm a very future-oriented person in general. So the kind of book that I'm drawn to by nature is not necessarily fiction. Like I like reading Marie Kondo, you know, how-to books, 12 Rules yeah. for Life. Like that's that's my impulse. But lately I've been reading a couple of novels that were really rich and rewarding. Um, and they all had to do with making sense of the past and of difficulty. Hmm. And that's much more beneficial, even though it might not seem like it at first. Not that it's directly A leads to B and B is my growth and A was this particular thing, mm -hmm. but that in real life, we don't have this experience of, oh, I learned to do this perfectly and then I went and did it and I did it perfectly. Ta-da. Yeah. <laughs> like what actually happens is we sin and we make mistakes and we don't do things perfectly. And then we have to live with the consequences Yeah. in hopefully forgiveness and grace and trusting Jesus to take our guilt away, but we still live in this world and we live in a world that's touched by sin. And so I was noticing this definite feeling as I finished each novel over the past couple of months. I was like, what is this feeling? <laughs> that is the feeling of the end of a story, which none of us have experienced in real life. We right. like... Closure is important to us psychologically, and it's a difficulty when we don't have it. We kind of have to overcome the fact that we don't have closure mm -hmm. with regard to something that has happened to us that's important. But actual closure can only come at the end of the great story where all right. of the things are shown not to be wasted, to see the purposes of everything that we've gone through. Now we, I was thinking about this earlier as we look at this, the stories within the story in the Bible. Um, the number of happy endings of full closure with regard to the story, not the history, mm -hmm. are few, but there are a number. And what I, what I mean by that is the, the details that are presented as story have an end and we're left with the impression of and they live happily ever after. Mm -hmm. We don't know what ha really happened after that. Except, unless the unless the, the Bible tells us, but you know, Ruth and Boaz is one of the wonderful love stories, and and mm -hmm. there's there's a happy ending, and in that sense, there's closure, and we know that they went on to have a baby, and the baby's name, and then the baby leads right to King David. We're not told explicitly about the end of their lives. He was probably a lot older than than she was. He probably died and left her a widow for a good time. Presumably, the community huddled around her. Naomi would be dead by then, but. The, the boy's growing up and the boy will take care of his mom. You know, and the story goes on, but that's a new story. Mm -hmm. At least literarily, we would think of that as a new story. The old story is sort of they had a baby and lived happily ever after, ever after being this vagueish term, <laughs> which in real life does not exist except, as you say, until the resurrection. When the resurrection comes, then we do live happily ever after for Christ. But in the meantime... I was thinking we have Abraham, we, we trace him through Sarah's death, but we he, he dies uh, old and full of days and apparently happy. And he sees that Isaac is doing okay and Jacob's, I think, uh, alive by then. But we're not given a lot of the details. Esther, um, yeah, kind of a happy ever after ending, but secular history tells us that the king she married didn't reign all that much longer. And Mordecai was already old when he became prime minister. So we don't know historically what happened. 
But at some point, the story has to stop. If we're, if we're telling it to another human being, the story has to stop because we can't go on storytelling forever. Only God gets to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we pick a point where it seems like we have resolved the major issues. Whatever we set up in the front is the conflict. It's been dealt with. And the people we love, we are, we are assured that these characters will live long, uneventful, safe, happy lives for some indefinite period of time that we need, we need not to ask about. Mm -hmm. And we are wise if we don't. Uh, to go, by, go back and write the sequels of, you know, <laughs> Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is, is really cute. <laughs> but do we really want to know what happened to Elizabeth and Darcy 10 years later? Well, some people do. Death comes to Jane, Pemberley. Yeah, exactly. If, if Jane Austen was a, had chosen to write it, and then we get sequels. Mm -hmm. Sometimes sequels are valid, especially if they were in the mind of the author, authors from the beginning. Sometimes they're just an attempt to get more money out of things, <laughs> um, to milk a, a product. But we, we, we want some kind of ending, some kind of closure, because, because we're not God. And because we can't go on storytelling forever. And unlike comic books or the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which keeps going and going and going, we need an end date. <laughs> we don't yep. keep telling the story of Captain America or Batman or Superman. Or Andy Griffith. For, or Andy Griffith <laughs> for 20, 30, 40 years. There's just a time where, you know what? the Five actor, seasons. That's all it yeah. should be. <laughs> five, Every I, I, show. I, yeah. Five season story. And there needs to be a story arc. needs to be planned. And it needs to wrap through a plot line and conclude because just the random, here are random days in the lives of, it's, that's what we used to get in TV. But enough people, enough producers, directors, and writers have shown us what it can be like mm -hmm. to have a story arc, to have a beginning and a purpose and an ending and closure that more and more, that's what we gravitate toward as opposed to, again, soap operas. <laughs> where the characters just are there forever. And one woman has, you know, three miscarriages, four abortions, five murder attempts, six marriages. You know, it just keeps going because there's only so many things you can do. But we want everyone's invested with this character. And the ones who aren't are dead. And new a new audience is constantly coming. So we have to keep recycling things and problems. And it's very bad, very bad storytelling. Mm -hmm. So we, we do look for the closure. Because there is a God who will bring closure, and because we're not him, we need to do it on a finite level. We need to have the happily ever after. We need to end things. Uh, we, we we can leave it open and assume that, you know, we don't know everything, and that these characters are going to go on, and they're going to have new adventures. But the things that we started, the problems we, we brought up in the beginning, they've been dealt with, at least to the point where we're okay with it. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we do feel... Uh, the sort of emptiness that uh, this is not the way stories work. Mm -hmm. I remembered, I, I got off track earlier and I remembered finally where I was going with that. The, 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 um, the fact that everything matters. If you, in, um, Chekhov said that mm -hmm. if you show a gun in act one, you have to use it by act three. One of my favorite movies is charade. Mm. Now, and it's not for everybody, and I think it's one of the best films ever made, but it does have some downsides. Audrey Hepburn, is, her character, is made the hero, the heroine, and she's an absolutely dizzy, stupid character. But she <laughs> has to be, because otherwise she would be a would-be adulterous, terrible flirt, and who knows what else. <laughs> but by shifting lines around and letting her do the come-on lines and Cary Grant carefully pushing her back until the very end, it, it almost it almost saves that, <laughs> but um, it's 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 an action adventure mystery romance comedy drama western. I think the only thing that's not there is sci fi, um, <laughs> but there is one scene when I, I often show the movie to my kids just to talk about how storytelling in movies works, and there's one scene where uh, Reggie and her girlfriend and the little boy have come back from the Alps. And they're dropping her off and she's getting ready to go up to her apartment. And the whole plot line's about to begin now because of what she's going to find inside. And the little boy, who's one of the worst child actresses ever in the history of film, um, calls out uh, Aunt Reggie. 
I wish you were going back to the States. Oh, so if I, why do you wish me to go? Because if you were, you could write me a letter. Oh, and then you could save the stamps. That's right. How about if I just buy you some? Okay. And then she goes into the story, goes up. At first glance, that seems to be the most wasted, ridiculous scene ever. But if you know where this is going, you look at it and it's like, okay, guys, did you just give everything away or what? Couldn't you found a more tactful <laughs> way? If we know, if, if we trust you as storytellers, then that scene meant something. It doesn't seem to. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. It just seems poorly done and a complete waste of our time. But if we're going to trust you, then that just meant something. And it meant something big enough to waste time, big enough to have this little... French boy actor, rough the lines. Something about stamps. This, there's something about stamps that's really important in this story. And yet, for a very, very long time, we hear nothing about stamps, except we keep seeing a letter that has stamped over and over again. But it's, <laughs> we never shown a close up. Now, if we were thinking, we would say, wait, nothing's ever wasted. <laughs> Let me see that envelope. And it's not until we're moving toward the climax that someone finally looks at the envelope and sees spoilers. the stamps. Sorry, dear one? Spoilers. Yeah, spo spoiler alerts. You know, <laughs> it's a little late goes. for that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, Anyhow, that's an example. And of course, God in Scripture does exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things that are hints uh, that are foreshadowing and they give a lot away. There are times when you, I mean, honestly, the father offering his only begotten son <laughs> on an altar just outside Jerusalem, mm -hmm. how, and, and naming the place, the Lord will provide, it will be seen here in the Mount of the Lord. What exactly are we missing there except for our own unbelief that cannot conceive of a God of grace? Now, not everything's like that. Not everything is a clearly drawn picture of Christ. And sometimes numbers are numbers just to show us, hey, there were a lot of people there, and that's important, and that this was a big thing, or there weren't very many people there. Sometimes the numbers are symbolic, or at least a hint. When Solomon collected 666 talents of gold a year, people said, well, that's, and I, I said this at one point, I think it just means he collected 666 talents of gold a year. Yes, so it but it means that's an, at least that. It means at least that, but as only one other time in Scripture it appears, isn't it possible that God is setting up something here when a king who should be leading God's people in worship is about to is breaking every single kingly rule and about to lead the nation into idolatry? Shouldn't that suggest hmm. something at the very least? To to me, it's it's something like you know we have a. a well, we had a gas station down on the corner. There was a big orange and blue ball that had 76 on it. <laughs> Turns out there's a couple reasons it does. One had to do with the kind of rate of fuel or something. But the other was that the founder of the company really appreciated our, his American heritage and wanted to celebrate the spirit of 76. That is 1776. Now, that's a backward cause and effect, sort of. <laughs> I named this this because of that. When our founding fathers... Through a revolution, they didn't say no. We can't. We, no, we can't do it in seventy-five because off in the future, some guy's going to name an entire <laughs> gas station line, and he's going to say seventy-six. We don't want to screw that up for him, so let's wait a year. Which, of course, would explain why the revolution was fought in seventy-six rather than in seventy-five when Paul Revere did the whole riding thing. They had to put it off a year because they had to keep things in line for seventy-six. No, they didn't. That's not. But. The one thing becomes that was true history, it really happened in 1776, becomes a historical precedent for an advertising campaign a couple hundred years later. Do you think God could pull that off since he controls all of time in history? I, I made a suggestion along these lines in my little book, Letter Revelation, and a, a very nice man who gave me a good review on the book generally called me to task for that. You can't do that. That's not the way reading scripture goes. Uh, yeah, it is, because that's the way life goes. Um, there are all kinds of things that, yes, they really happen. But God's the one who made them happen. They weren't historical accidents. Mm -hmm. They didn't just kind of pop out there and God said, oh, that's that's interesting. Hmm. Uh, God ordained them, or knowing all things in advance. Known to God are all his works from the beginning of the world, Acts 15. 
So when God ordained that that should be the number of talents of gold that Solomon collected, he already knew that he was going to use that number again. Um, is that all there is to it? Doesn't it mean it really happened? Of course it really happened. And it's a minor point. Probably far more significant are the fact that man and beast were created on the sixth day mm -hmm. and that Jesus uh, was betrayed and crucified on the sixth day, on the sixth hour after six trials. Mm -hmm. There are other images that work into that. But that's, again, we're back to everything means something. It may not mean anything huge, but God does not just talk to hear himself talk. He talks to tell us things. And it's up to us to figure it out. I was teaching along these lines one point, and um, a gentleman in Sunday school said, wait, well, and he turned to some random passage, probably in Chronicles, and read me, so there were this many soldiers. He says, does that mean anything? I, I, an I, I answered truthfully, but badly. I said, I don't know. Well, the answer was, of course it does, because God put it there. Now, if you're <laughs> asking me what it means, that's a very different question. And are you asking, does this have some kind of symbolic usage or is it some kind of image that God's going to develop? Uh, that number does not sound familiar, so probably not. But does it mean something? Absolutely, or God wouldn't have put it there. Uh, that would have been a better answer than the one I gave, which was, I don't know. I haven't looked at the text. So, yes, but <laughs> yes, it, it does mean something, obviously. Yeah. Whether but, yeah. we know what it means is a separate Whether we know, question. Yeah, that's, that's a very different question, whether or not we know what it means and how important it is relatively. Mm -hmm. The the confessions tell us that there are some things that are in Scripture that are more urgent to our salvation than other things. But everything serves our salvation. The things which are revealed belong to us and to our children, that we may learn to do all these words of the law. Sometimes when people get to Revelation or other prophetic books, or even to Genesis 1, I don't think God ever meant us to understand that. <laughs> he says he did. And, and that's a cop-out. That's being intellectually and spiritually lazy to say, I'm not going to try to figure it out because it's too controversial and I don't know. It's all right to say I don't know. <laughs> and to say I'm going to chew on that for a few years. That's great. Uh, and we, there are some things we may never know for sure because uh, sin is in the way and we're listening to contradictory interpretations from people we respect and we're pulled this way and that. That's life. That's sinful life in in, in the Christian church. But to give up and say, God didn't know what he was doing and God didn't mean anything is something very, very, very different. And returning full circle, that, and as human beings, of course, we don't have God's degree of accuracy, like the charade incident. They could have done that much better than they did. I still, it grates on my nerves every single time, but it was necessary. If they had not done that, if they had not somehow included that little, that little uh, bit of information, then the story would have would have felt very forced and contrived at the end. Mm -hmm. I had an art teacher once argue that all art is abstract. I went to a very conservative school, and right. so students would come in and say, oh, I don't like abstract art. It doesn't mean anything. It's not beautiful. Um, and he says, well, if you didn't have the abstract, all you have is the original. Right. So you have to make decisions about what to include and what not to include based on what you want to communicate and what is important to communicate right. for your purposes. Yeah. The, the purpose of art, and this is a line from uh, Lewis's Great Divorce, is talking to an artist who's being offered a ticket into heaven. And, well, won't I be allowed to paint it all? Well, yes, when you get there and you've been there a while, you will see some things more clearly than the rest of us. And one thing you want to do is tell us about them. But looking comes first. Mm -hmm. And the artist is impatient. No, the artist needs to be creating right now. I don't, I don't need to wait. I know exactly what I want to do. I, no, that's not the way it works. But I appreciate the line, you'll see some things more clearly than the rest and you'll want to tell us about them. Mm -hmm. That's art, whether it's visual or the plastic arts or literary arts. The, the author, if he or she is any good, has seen something about reality, God's reality. And he or she wants to tell it to us in, in a way that gets our attention and makes it stick. And good writers do that. Bad writers fail miserably. <laughs> and there are not that many good writers in the end. But those of us who aspire to writing can keep on working and trying to figure it out and listen to criticism and read good examples of how others have done it 
uh, which is the justification for reading not only Christian authors, but non-Christian authors, because God gives skill in lots of ways and lots of directions. And there are a lot of people we can learn for, from, even mm -hmm. if we can't adopt their morality or their religious point of view. So I think we've, I think we've kind of talked all our way around it at this point. Yes. And that is the end of our time. <laughs> so do you have any recommendations of stories or of other things? Watch Charade. Watch Charade. <laughs> right. <laughs> Audrey Hepburn, Cary Grant, music by uh, Henry Mancini, and a cast of characters played by very popular television actors, but they wouldn't get popular until after they were in this mm. movie. But again, these are not Christian characters, and there's some things we're going to say, ew, but it's not. There's no, there's only one or two places where you might want to be tempted to, well, not shut your eyes, but kind of, you know, look over at the painting on the wall because <laughs> this, is, this is this is a little over the top. So with that right. with that said, it is one of the best movies to come out of Hollywood. Yeah, out of Hollywood, remember. <laughs> yeah. All right, Charade. My... Recommendation is going to be Shop Around the Corner. It's another mm. really excellent movie in which nothing is wasted. It's yes. an adaptation of a stage play, so the efficiency of the storytelling uh. is really admirable. There's only a few sets. Every line matters to tell you about uh. the characters, and it's just a very beautiful story. Yeah, my, one of my wife's favorite movies. Mm. Your opinion. My, kid, my kids are learning that sort of Just I only want your opinion. Your honest, your honest opinion. opinion. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of my favorite characters. Yeah. The only thing he doesn't want to do in the world is give you his honest opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Unlike us, we've got lots of opinions. If you've got opinions and you want to share them with us, you can email us at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. <laughs> Thanks so much for this conversation, Greg. It's been a delight. Thank you. Thanks I'll also to find out what UFO abducted Brian. Yeah. Um, I think he texted me in the middle of this oh, okay. conversation to let me know whether he had fallen off the face of the earth or not. So, all right. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. As I said, you can email us with your opinions and comments and questions and whatnot. You can also like our Facebook page. That would be great. Leave us a review. Tell a friend about us. See you next time.